Thank you. Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for holding out. I know that this is the end of a very long day. I know that your brains are super full, um, but we're excited to give you this wonderful panel discussion on transformative plants. My name is Dr. Leah Linder. I'm a naturopathic physician and also co-founder and leader of SETA Seminary, which is the Church of Spiritual Integration. And I'll let the rest of the panelists introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren uh, Siderman Fields. I'm a doctor of acupuncture and oriental medicine, and I'm also a classically trained chef. And so uh, my husband and I both have our, our doctorates in this field, and we have two clinics in South Florida. Um, but if you'd like any more information, I can give it to you right after. Thank you. Hi, I'm Megan Klein. I am a serial entrepreneur. I am uh, the CEO and founder of Little Saints. We make uh, non-alcoholic beverages infused with functional mushrooms and sacred plants. It is my mission in life to be a part of uh, evolving the future of imbibing away from alcohol and towards uh, non-alcoholic beverages and plant medicines. Hi, I'm Stephanie Wang. I'm the founder and CEO of Ka Empathogenics. And um, what we do is that we offer kana in daily supplements. And if you're not familiar with kana, it's this beautiful plant that we'll be talking about. And um, our mission is to restore full spectrum aliveness for all beings. And I'm just really happy to be here. We are glad to have you. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Lola. They call me Dr. O. I'm a clinical pharmacist by trade, and also an indigenous herbalist. I was born and raised in uh, Nigeria, West Africa. We use a lot of these plants as wellness tools, so I'm the founder of WCI Health. We are alternative health and wellness hub. Basically, we help people get and stay well using the healing powers of plant medicine. For me, I'm I pride myself in having the best of both of being and growing up with plant medicine and also being a clinical pharmacy. So it's like merging the two work to take us to where we are kind of trying to get to, which is wellness. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies. And I feel so honored to be on the stage with all of these beautiful ladies that are supporting plant medicine. So just take a little minute and be so excited that like women are coming into this field in such a strong way. So just really, really proud of that. Uh, so as we dive into this topic of uh, functional plant medicine and how we actually use that in our lives, uh, could each of you briefly just introduce one plant that has your little heart space um, that you want to talk about today and give a brief introduction as to why you chose that plant to talk about today? Okay, so um, also in our category was neotrop neotropics, so I chose lion's mane mushroom, which is what I did my doctoral thesis on. Um, just very quickly, it's a you know it's thousands of years old, and we use it in Chinese medicine as an as a Chinese herb, and it is really kind of incredible now that it's getting more recognition for being a nootropic and for cognitive function and for increasing nerve growth factor in the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, and yeah, I'm I'm it's my baby. 
Okay, and because we have an expert on lion's mane, I am going to pick another favorite, which is uh, Palo Santo. So Little Saints created the first that we know of, edible Palo Santo extract. We um, source it very sustainably, directly from a community in northern Peru where they harvest the dead and fallen trees. Um, we have a USDA timber permit. We work directly with the Peruvian people, and um, we all know what Palo Santo is here, but it has a long history of... Um, clearing negative energy and being used in a ceremonial way. And hilariously, the um, Peruvian community that we work with just thinks of it as mosquito repellent. So as I mentioned, um, definitely, um, my favorite plant is Kana. And Kana is also known as Skeletium tortuosum, not to be confused with Kava or Kratom. And it's not as known yet, but it's definitely gaining more and more momentum and notoriety. It is a natural serotonin reuptake inhibitor and serotonin releasing agent. And it's basically a beautiful entheogen that's not psychedelic. So it's psychoactive, but not, psych not psychedelic. And it's an empathogen, so it's a heart opener. And it's beautiful because it helps people connect, helps create more empathy towards ourselves and each other. And actually, you know, we really believe, and I personally believe, that this plant is coming into more recognition these days, given what's happening in the world, and that we really you know, need more heart-centeredness. And beyond that, it's actually a cognitive enhancer as well, so it helps actually connect head and heart. It helps with memory, with focus, um, with um, problem solving and creativity. And the indigenous Koiko and San of South Africa have been the, the traditional stewards of this plant. And they've been taking it for millennia for mental health reasons. And also when they go on multi-day hunts because Kana actually helps them um, improve their endurance and stamina when they go on these hunts. And it also helps regulate their hunger and thirst, and, and excuse me, thirst, and it suppresses um, that when they actually go hunting, so it really helps them build resilience. Um, but the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful things also is that besides that empathogenic quality, it actually helps regulate our amygdala and the nervous system. So over time, it actually helps reset the nervous system, and it's an adaptogen as well, which is really unusual because a lot of these plants are not necessarily psychoactive and psychedelic plants are not necessarily adaptogenic, but Kana is, and that makes it super special. So it's not toxic. Um, it's actually used for, um, for treating addiction, particularly alcohol abuse in South Africa, and there's also no tolerance buildup. So uh, for me, I love uh, mushroom, functional mushroom. I carry them in my store, WCI Health. Well, I would like to talk about cola. We call it cola nuts. That is uh, one of the uh, psychoactive. I wouldn't call it psychoactive. It's not psychedelic, but it has psychoactivity. Most of us, if not all of us, probably apart from me, <laughs> I don't drink uh, coffee. I do chocolate. But this particular cola, it is one of the main natural source of caffeine. And when we look at what caffeine, everybody we drink caffeine, well, a lot of us don't even realize that this is one of the top, maybe three nootropics uh, that we have in our, in our, in our bag. And uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi, back in the days, the actual caffeine from those drinks were originally derived from uh, cola, and cola itself is also an extended family of cocoa. So for indigenous people where I was born, because even just like psychedelic, like peyote, uh, ayahuasca, indigenous folks generally, they see these plants as uh, rituals, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual uh, relationship for them. So for cola, there is hardly any ceremony that goes on in the African culture that they don't break cola. And when they, be, when they open it up, it's like in Baptist, and they'll say, he that brings cola brings life. 
That is one unique thing they will say. He that brings cola brings light. Because this particular uh, plant uh, has a lot of properties. And I do tell people that plants are medicine. A whole lot of, most of our conventional pharmaceuticals were originally derived from herbs. So there's so many uh, ways that our generation before us have, you know, step up their wellness using different wellness tools. And we have deviated from that. I'm hoping, and that's what was talking with Stephanie, that I'm hoping that we get back to that uh, route of starting low and going slow. I, as a pharmacist, I work retail, I've worked different areas, had tw over 20 years experience in clinical, uh, as, a, as a clinician, you know. We see opioid addiction, overdose and everything out there. But we have plants like Kratom, and exactly what you were talking about, Rebels. Can I? Yeah. The generation before us have shown that it has effectiveness towards wellness. Why are we not going towards this? That's why I'm so glad to be on stage with these amazing ladies. We're going to, we got to keep pushing. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you did such a lovely job of talking about the cultural and historical significance of cola or coca. Um, but Megan, Palo Santo also has a really strong historical context from a cultural perspective. Can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. So the Palo, Palo Santo is a tree, and um, it is in the ground for 30 to 50 years before it dies naturally. And then... Um, the, the proper way to harvest it is that the tree dies and falls down, and then the community harvests it and um, you know processes it into either Palo Santo sticks, or in our case, the um, community itself has a little processing facility that they press oil out of it. So the like the cultural significance is it's from Ecuador and Peru, and um, it has been used. It's really funny actually having a direct relationship with the community because I think about um, Armando and he would be laughing because he's like, no, we use it as a mosquito repellent. The fancy people in the cities and the fancy shamans in the Peruvian cities bring it and they use it in ceremony. But the people in the village actually, like it is like a very functional plant. But it is, um, it has been used in ceremony in South America and then of course came to us um, and and, you know, just in yoga studios now, but it is um, known to clear negative energy. So it is a very sacred plant because we interact with it with intention. We ask it to, you know, clear what needs to be cleared and kind of clear the negative energy. The proper way to, you know, like work with Palo Santo in the spiritual context is to burn a stick of it. You let the flame burn for as long as like 30 seconds actually is the way. And then you blow it out. So you are um, like in the Peruvian way, you are like, really like interacting with the plant with intention with the flame so it's like you're creating something and then um, you blow it out and the reason the cultural significance you know there it's, Palo Santo is a hot button because for a while and still um, Palo Santo was being harvested unsustainably because there was more um, demand for it in the U.S. basically and so they were harvesting trees that were not dead and that really like disrupts the um, the growth patterns and like the ability for the forest to regenerate itself and so of course you want to you know preserve like the ecosystem of the communities that have been growing Palo Santo for millennia. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good point, um, especially for plants in general, right? We have co-evolved with these wonderful beings that provide us with antimicrobials and antifungals, way to grow and develop our brains from a nootropic perspective, ways to help enhance our immune system function, help us connect with others from a heart perspective. You know, fungi, in, you know, in particular, too, we know it provides all of these wonderful psychoactive and neuroplastic capabilities as well. But, you know, we're not separate from these plants. We've co-evolved with them. And so I think that it's very important to talk about the historical perspective of why we use these plants and then also utilize that to say that, you know, we have to be stewards of these beautiful creatures as well and help propagate them, help make sure that they're going to be here for the next generation because they've offered us so much historically. 
So moving on, um, you know, Dr. Lauren, based on your perspective and specialty in traditional Chinese medicine, can you talk a little bit about lion's mane mushroom and how that can help enhance cognitive function, mood, mental well-being? So there are two main active compounds. Well, there's two main active compounds in um, in lion's mane mushroom. One is arinokines and one is hericinones. And so they both create nerve growth factor production in the, in the brain, in the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system by binding to acetylcholine and increasing acetylcholine production. Um, what I actually did my, my research on was I did lion's mane from a Chinese medicine perspective for, uh, as it pertains to Alzheimer's disease. So I compared it to the three main cholinesterase inhibitors that they give to uh, Alzheimer's page, patients and I um, used the comparison of the effects and side effects. And actually the research was pretty amazing how it showed that not only are the effects actually uh, way more than the three main drugs that they give, but also it can mitigate the side effects from those three drugs. So it boosts cognitive function, but it also helps with anxiety, it helps with brain fog and focus and mental clarity. And it also works on your, you know, gastric issues, and it works on uh, the heart, and it works on insulin and sugar, you know, blood sugar. So it really is so diverse. And um, what I wanted to talk about is one of the, the main component that is arenakines is actually derived from the mycelium. So it's actually amazing because the mycelium looks like nerve bundles, right? And so it's actually working on your nerves. So it's very important to, um, to when you're choosing a product, well, I guess we'll talk about this in, in a few, but it's very important when you're choosing a product that it, they include uh, mycelium as well, not just the fruiting body. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important to recognize that these plants are not single function, right? They're going to offer us many different capabilities. And, um, you know, would you, do you want to speak a little bit about more about Kana, about how, I mean, you spoke a little bit about how are the different, you know, aspects of the body that it can actually touch, but maybe just go into that a little bit more in the different aspects of what Kana can offer? Sure. So Kana is really interesting. It has um, at least 25 different alkaloids that are known, but the main ones are actually mesembrine and mesembrinone that are the most studied. And they work on um, so many different receptors. So besides being a serotonin reuptake inhibitor and a serotonin releasing agent in, in, the, in, the, in the way that it activates a protein called VMAT2, uh, which helps ne transport neurotransmitters out of cells, what it also does is that it activates receptors for GABA, for opioids, for cholecystokinin, and for melatonin. So that's interesting in the sense that, well, besides calming brain activity and lifting mood, it also um, actually helps to suppress hedonic cravings, so excessive cravings. So there's a difference between, let's say, homeostatic hunger, which is the hunger you need to feed your body so that you know, the bodily functions can perform optimally, and then there's... Um, hedonic cravings and excessive cravings, like when you cannot stop eating that bag of potato chips, that which you know, is our you know, human addiction to uh, salt, fat, and sugar, because those substances are really addictive. So Kana has this really interesting ability to help actually curb those excessive, excessive cravings. And hence, it's been used in South Africa to treat addiction and in particular alcohol abuse. Um, another interesting, um, beautiful aspect is that it acts as a PDE4 inhibitor. So it almost has this contra, you know, maybe counterintuitive uh, way of working, which is it calms and uplifts at the same time while giving you grounded energy. Um, but being an in a PDE inhibitor, PDE4 inhibitor, that's exactly what it does. It actually helps the body resource more energy. And Dr. Leah, you were saying how, you know, we unfortunately, maybe in the Western culture, like to think of everything as linear. Okay, this particular substance is for this purpose or this medicine is for this, but you look at nature and every, you know, every plant, fungi, um, and, and, you know, all those substances have multiple functions and how they work on our cellular systems, our nervous systems, our immune systems is, is, you know, is very holistic, right? 
And so, yeah, it's the same thing with Kana. It really helps regulate the nervous system. It has um, amazing uh, cognitive enhancement abilities. And it also has this beautiful and pathogenic, you know, heart opening um, aspect as well as helping, uh, as well as being ergogenic, which means it helps with physical performance, like endurance and stamina. And all those things, if you're like, oh wait, doesn't, you know, that may not make sense, but actually if you look into it and how the human body works, and you look at how plant um, alkaloids work and how they affect our neuroreceptors and our bodies, it's really not surprising because that's how everything works. It's just bringing that perspective into, into health and wellness and into treatment, um, I think is something that although many of us know it could be more, I guess, be more forward and be, um, and more education should be, I feel. Absolutely. Yeah, well, that. and I thank you so much, mm -hmm. um, Stephanie. That was a really d good description because I, you know, we have this perspective that we got taught at a very young age: the knee bones connected to the brain bone, right? Like you can like use that rhyme and rhythm to recognize that our body is one beautiful ecosystem that is learning how to be in homeodynamic balance. I know that the word homeostatic gets thrown out so often and it just drives me nuts because we're not static beings. We are always moving, adapting, changing to our environment and the plants do the same thing, you know, and when they're put out in, sh in stressed environments like desert plants, um, high Arctic plants. Those are the ones that produce really significant amounts of these phytochemicals that can actually affect the body. So stress isn't necessarily a bad thing. We just have to recognize how that actually can get interpreted into our body and how we can manifest that in different ways in disease as well as in health. So remember that little rhyme that we learned when we were very young kids. Um, so Dr. Lola, I wanted to ask you, um, because of your deep cultural, historical perspective of plant medicine and you see all these rising trends of oh you know today it's this and tomorrow it's that from your perspective and your cultural understanding what plant medicine do you see is going to come up on the rise like what's the hidden gem or something that's going to get a little bit more of the spotlight do you feel in the next couple of years uh, thank you so much uh, for that question for me, and also I want to really uh, say thank you for bringing the fact that plants, we cannot put them in a box. <laughs> they refuse to be put in a box. When we talk about entourage effect, normally we think our head of ging, 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 cannabis. No, cannabis is not just the only plant with entourage effect. Even our spinach, our veggies, they all have those phenol, flavonol, essential oil that we need, some of them that we can't even synthesize. We have to get them from this food. And the beauty of, of plant is that, not even just plant, we are what we eat. Part of why we, have, we, are, going, we are seeing a lot of disease, and you physicians, I mean, that's your field, you know. I see them in my pharmacy. I, have, I mean, I have to analyze the drugs. But part of why we are seeing this level of disease that we are seeing is what we eat. A whole bunch of meat, we pack with steroid, all kind of junk. I was telling Stephanie, I said, my grandmom, she's over 100 years old and she lives in Africa. How is she doing it? You know? So the beautiful thing when it comes to plants is that we can put them in a box. And when, when we talk about which of these plants is going to be the big guy, we can't really pin them down. But, I mean, kratom, when you look at kratom, I mean, you look at the receptor, this particular agent is working, opioid receptor, dopamine. Do you, I mean, when we talk about opioid receptor, that is huge for us. When we talk about dopamine, we have in the Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson that level, then we can even also even bring it to the opioid uh, uh, epidemic addiction. Is we, can go, we can go a bit crazy out there. But when we talk about the gem, the superstar, I can just not resist mushroom. Those functional mushroom, rishi, shiitake, uh, maitake, 
Turkey tail, I mean, we have data, clinical data, with evidence of this agent destroying cancer, all kind of stuff. You cannot go wrong on mushroom, functional mushroom. And we have to be able to explain it to our client, to our family member. When we hear mushroom, we're like, oh my God, we're gonna fall down. No, these are agents that doesn't have the psychoactive that we see in our psilocybin. But apart from that, the beauty of it is this. The beauty of mushroom is that they belong in the family of mushroom. You, you have the similar DNA as your sisters and brothers, but you don't look exactly like them. I believe the mushroom, being connected to the psychedelic mushroom, they do have some of those DNA that makes those psychedelic mushrooms so special when it comes to our consciousness that they have some of those DNA in us. So we don't have to start with the psychedelic uh, part of stuff, especially for those of our family members, our clients, our patients, that are a bit skeptical when it comes to taking that next step. Mushroom is what we all need to be on. Yeah? Amen. I love that. Yeah. Mushrooms going to change the planet. Um, okay, so Dr. Lauren, um, if possible, could you share a personal story or example that you have personally experienced or witnessed um, with the power or transformation of these incredible plants and fungi? Sure. So, uh, okay, I'm going to jump back a little bit. So before I, I was always in love with mushrooms, but before I really got into lion's mane mushroom, I was basically suffering from anxiety, from, I had like severe, severe menstrual issues, like the, the worst pain ever, ovarian cysts, ruptured, there was in the hospital, it was like a whole thing, right? And so uh, the conventional Western medical model, not that there's not a time and place for it, but it didn't really do so much for me. And so all the doctors really just kind of wanted to put me on medication and uh, then when it didn't work, just up the dose and up the dose and oh, maybe this one will work and really nothing worked, right? So I decided, it, it, it happened for a while, and then I entered into acupuncture and Chinese medicine school. I got on some Chinese herbs, and that really was like super transformative for me. Um, all the symptoms lessened, and then at the same time, still I was having ovarian cysts, which ruptured. So a few of the doctors that I saw, said, they said, oh, actually, it's gonna be really hard for you to get pregnant. And so, which is super weird, because why would you tell that to like a young woman, you know, and put that in their head? But um, I started taking different herbs. I took uh, a very high concentration of broccoli sprout extract, which if you need more information, uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, her work is really amazing. Um, so I took that, and I took also another uh, thing called IP6, which is a high concentration of inositol, a fiber. And actually, my, I didn't have any more cysts, um, and I was able to get pregnant very luckily on the first or second try, which numerous doctors told me that it was not going to happen. So I really attribute that to having done, you know, certain herbal, herbal protocols. And then also uh, when I was pregnant, um, I was fine for the most part, but I did have fibroids that I didn't know were growing. And it was like debilitating. I was on bed rest. I couldn't walk. I was excruciating pain. And again, I went to the Oncoplex, which is a very high concentration of broccoli sprout extract and the IP6. And because of the estrogen buildup during pregnancy, they were not supposed to shrink, but they did shrink within a week. And I was completely fine and out of pain and out of walking. Fast forward to having two kids later and everything's great. I, have zero, I, I take it every day. I have zero uh, pain. I don't even know when my, it's maybe too much information for all of you, but like for, for us women, it's like, you know, really important. I don't even know, other than me knowing my body, but I don't have any pain showing me that, oh, okay, your period's coming, you know? So that's really amazing. And so for a lot of our patients, we also um, recommend certain herbal protocols or certain, um, it, it, everything is really kind of customized to each, each individual, but um, all of these, these herbs and plants are so transformative and literally changed my life. And then, as well as lion's mane mushroom, which I take and, and have noticed a significant difference in, in just how I'm feeling overall, my mood, um, you know, thinking, just everything, you know? Yeah, yeah so absolutely. thank you. 
So unfortunately, we are just now getting the little time warning that we need to wrap this up, even though I know all five of us could sit up here and just rave about plants so much. Uh, they are our allies. They are our spiritual teachers. They are our wellness gurus that we have so much to learn from. And frankly, science is just scratching the surface. So thank you guys so much for coming and being excited about this beautiful plant medicine. Uh, we have a little, a couple of minutes for Q&A, so if you guys have any questions, we're happy to answer them. So does anybody have any questions generally about what we talked about, about other transformative plants, other things you got burning? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's a great question. So her question is, what are the contraindications for the different plants that we talked about? And what are some of those contraindications? So do you want to talk about lion's mane? Sure. So in my research, uh, I have found that it's actually non-toxic and there's really no contraindications other than if you have like a mushroom allergy or something, uh, which is not super common. But if you do, then stay away from it, you know. Uh, taken in high doses, it could cause like some, some stomach discomfort, but I've never seen it, you know, especially when someone's taking like a therapeutic dose, which is around four to six grams. Um, I, it's, it's really quite amazing. I can share my research with you after, but... What, not really. One little therapeutic trick on that is that if anybody has any uh, indigestion, nausea issues with any type of mushroom, whether that be functional mushroom or psychedelic, if you take them either with digestive enzymes um, or you actually soak them in some sort of acidic thing, whether that be orange juice, lemon juice, lime juice, those types of things for about 30 minutes before you take them, the nausea disappears. So... Put that one in your back pocket. Uh, do you want to go ahead and talk about Palo Santo? Sure, this is a weird one because we were like, wait, you're going to ingest a tree. So that's like a little concerning. And so what we learned was that the Palo Santo tree, because most other things, if you ever ingest it, it's like the, it's either aged in a Palo Santo cask or something. It's not actually the oil from the tree. So we did our research with the scientists and Palo Santo comes from the same family as mint and fennel. And apparently when you um, ingest too much mint, there's like a possible toxicity issue, but it's like really, really remote. So actually we found that um, ingesting the Palo Santo oil, especially in like the extract form, there's no contraindications. So one little fine tip on there too. Um, a big part of that is that it relaxes the lower esophageal sphincter, which is what connects the esophagus to the stomach. And so basically what that's telling you is that you're, it lowers your stomach acid so that sphincter can't actually close. So if you take a shot of apple cider vinegar with it, it will increase your stomach acid. Ain't no thing. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Dr. St our Stephanie. Please. So in terms of contraindications for Kana, um, for pharmaceuticals, SSRIs, MAOIs, SNRIs, and also um, CNS depressants. So the reason is because Kana is a natural serotonin reuptake inhibitor and serotonin releasing agent, so you don't want to be taking something that affects serotonin and raises level serotonin when you've already taken something that's affecting serotonin levels, you know, in case of serotonin, in, in case of you, you know, getting serotonin syndrome. Um, some of the other things to, to, that may happen, some people do have some sensitivity to Kana initially uh, with a little bit of headache and nausea, but as with many plants, when you start taking it, and um, if you give it a little bit of time and take it regularly, your body needs time to prime itself for this new substance, and that all that usually goes away. So, but the main ones are anything that, that affects serotonin levels. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a really important key because serotonin mm -hmm. syndrome is real. I have only seen it a very small handful of times, but it is a medical emergency. So be very mindful of that. Dr. Yeah. Lola? Yeah. So for me, uh, when I'm talking to, because I'd also teach uh, psychedelic uh, lectures and cannabis as medicine classes, when I'm talking to my student, I say, when you talk about plants generally, we have to be subjective, which is they are partial agonists, sometimes they are partial antagonists, mixed agonists, antagonists. So they're not binding to the receptor and sitting down there and activating your receptor like average uh, synthetic uh, product would do. So most of the time, everything that we eat is risk against benefit. 
is, is we, even water can kill us. So that is what I always try to tell people that apart from warfaring, cumulating that is literally interacts with everything, it's a subjective uh, side effect that we will call it. For cola, being a caffeine is a caffeinated uh, nut. So basically, we have to be careful about what we combine it, especially if you are taking coffee and you are also chewing on this cola. So that is it. Then as for kratom, like I've said, it's a risk against benefit. And what we have seen is that some of these plants, they can even modulate or potentiate the effect of other medicine that you are taking. Yeah. And serotonin syndrome, like uh, uh, the doctor said, is not, it's relatively, it's not, you don't see it most times. What we need to look for when it comes to serotonin syndrome is somebody taking maybe SSRIs and trazodone, tramadol. People don't even know about those drugs. You have pain, they give you tramadol, you have SSRI, then you take maybe psychedelic mushroom. That's when we begin to see the additive effect of this agent. And I'm going to wrap up right there. Right there. Yeah. yeah, really great question. Thank you for asking that. Any other questions from the crowd? Yes, please. Great question. So the question was looking into the endocannabinoid system and people that are wanting to balance out their central nervous system to be in more of that homeodynamic balance. Um, what other plants can we actually use to encourage that? So, yeah, go ahead. Apart from, I mean, cannabis is a magic uh, medicine. Apart from that, we've also seen that Plants that have beta caryophyllin in them are very good because part of what beta caryophyllin does is bind to the CB2 receptor, which is uh, one of the main receptors that controls our immune system, peripheral system. Basically, everything that has to do with our connective tissue, bone, uh, all those stuff, that is what CB2 receptor does. So we're looking at agents with uh, beta caryophyllin in them. One of those are like black pepper. I mean, these agents, we don't, sometimes we don't need them in high quantity. Less is more when it comes to some of these agents. And that's what, that's what the data is showing us, when, especially when it comes to cannabis and the cannabinoid, especially the minor cannabinoid agent, yeah. I think just to add to that too, there's a whole classification of plants called adaptogens. And adaptogens are a fancy word of saying they help our bodies adapt to stress. And we have calming adaptogens and we also have stimulating adaptogens. So if somebody has more of an anxious, uh, rapid mind state and you're wanting to calm that nervous system down, plants adaptogens like ashwagandha, um, a kava are another really great one. Um, I'm trying to, of course, rod well, rhodiola is a stimulating adaptogen. So that, so if somebody has more of that depressed mood, they're having a hard time getting out of bed, they're having need in that cup of coffee first thing in the morning and then also in the afternoon, things like American ginseng, rhodiola, um, these can be stimulating adaptogens to help our bodies, you know, stimulate our nervous system so that we can be in more balance. So look into the family of adaptogens for that. And kana is also, also an adaptogen. Yeah. Well, Kava is also an adaptogen, and it's Kana. a calming adaptogen. Yeah. So, any other questions? Actually, okay. Dr. Leah, may yeah. I? May I? Um, for at the end of this, my colleague Brooke is standing back there. She actually has a bowl of our Kana products, which is our Kana chews. So, uh, we're inviting everyone to try, as long as you are not on SSRIs or MAOIs or SNRIs or on CNS depressants. Would love to invite you to to try. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you guys so much for coming right. and think about plans. <laughs>